no, we did. Not we did. I'm not going to know because it'll embarrass him. But um, uh, thank you very much for turning out on this snowy first day of spring, and we're looking forward to hearing your talk. Yeah. Much. Cheers. Thanks. Thank you very much. Well, I'm I'm on, on Facebook Live as well, um, so hopefully um, the people who couldn't make it today are, are, are there. But we have quite a few people here as well, so thank you very much for coming out. Um, I'm also sending out some some live tweets about what's happening. Um, and some of the links to stuff that I'm talking about. So if you want to follow on, on Twitter as well, you can. I think I'm going to stay seated um, so that I can stay in the frame of the, the iPad. So um, anyway, um, thank you very much for having me. Um, and uh, I'll just get into it. Um, hopefully I'll get into it. Um, I've been having technical problems all day so far. Um, so <laughs> I... Uh, I teach stylistics here, which um, everyone always asks the question about what stylistics is, but stylistics essentially is the uh, um, use of linguistic tools to study literature. And um, my side of, of, of the stylistics and, and the interest that I have in, in literature has been more focused on, on religious uh, interpretations of, uh, of the Bible and how people have interacted about those sorts of things online. Um, a couple of my students were here, they were reading one of my articles uh, earlier today um, as a part of a, a class. So we were talking about metaphor in particular. I've been interested in metaphor for a long time. And um, as I've been sort of moving forward in, in the work that I've been, I've been doing, I'm interested in, uh, in language and religion more generally and um, have just finished a book uh, that I have a copy of if you want to have a look at later um, on religious talk online and I'm going to be presenting essentially on the research that I've done, uh, I've done for that. Um, and uh, for me, the questions when you start talking about religious talk online and what it is that people are are doing when they talk about religion online or doing religious things online um, comes back to these basically these two questions for me all the time about to what extent are what people doing new are they doing anything new when they're doing something online and to what extent is that new behavior shaping um, or that that new technology shaping are interacting in, in a social context um, so whenever I'm I'm thinking about the data that I'm looking at, the people that I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about, this is what I, uh, I continually come back to. Um, we have to think, uh, I don't know, um, in some way brand, brand new and it's just deteriorating of, uh, of society. I, I, for one, don't take kind of that, uh, that, that negative of a view. I don't take a very positive view either. I, I like to think of myself as being somewhere in the middle of, of, uh, pessimism or optimism about uh, about technology in general. Um, but I would start off by saying that I think there's historical precedent for talking about the changing of uh, uh, the changing of religion and religious beliefs because of technology and, and the theologians I imagine in, in the audience would uh, would uh, agree with me in that to say that uh, there's uh, there is some precedent for um, for technology having influence uh, on on how people believe uh, and, and what they believe. Um, when we think about technology then in terms of if we're thinking about Facebook or we're thinking about whatever it is that we're, we're doing analysis of, we have to be able to have some, some historical perspective on it. And the point for me is that communications don't just appear in a vacuum, right? We don't just we don't just suddenly have Facebook and we haven't had anything before. We've had some history of, of, of social interaction online and people remember this or they, 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 they start off in some understanding of, of how social interaction um, works um, in online context and then take that to Facebook or they take that to YouTube and they, they apply what they know and, um, and develop something new, right? So when I'm thinking about YouTube um, in particular, I'm thinking about the technology that have come before YouTube, how people view the technology that's available to them and then how they're um, uh, how they're engaging with it and and how that engagement is developing in uh, in, uh, in in new ways but also in ways that are that have in some way been um, been a part of what what's been done in the past um, as a linguist I'm particularly interested in di discourse practices and how people how people use language that's that's my my focus I'm interested in, in language use in particular um, but there's of course a lot of different lenses that you could you could look at any of the things that I'm talking about um, and uh, I guess I'm making the point here that if I haven't sort of hit you over the head too much with it already, um, I don't think that it's entirely novel what's happening in, in, in online interaction. Um, 
I have my uh, my technology and belief uh, example here of the of the printing press. Um, I, I wrote this uh, this this meme about the printing press, but I realized that it, it involved you needed a knowledge. It's a very sort of uh, uh, difficult Venn Venn diagram of people who understand meme culture and then understand like printing press history as well as to why it would be funny. But um, I, I, I in talking about the ways in which technology changes belief systems and changes the way that people get information, I mean the printing press is a good example of uh, of technology that that did have a pretty serious effect on how people uh, uh, viewed uh, viewed the world and viewed information. Um, we don't spend much time anymore going into we don't spend any time. Say we don't spend much time. We don't spend any time marveling at the book as a a kind of technological wonder. Right, but it is. You know, yeah, the, the book is a is is as much a technological wonder as as the iPad is, um, and it spreads information in um, in uh, in in interesting and um, unexpected ways uh, in the same way that the that the iPad or the the iPhone um, might have at the time. Um, so the printing press is uh, is is <coughs> not. Analogous, but it's a, it's it's useful to think about um, how in in the past we find ourselves um, uh, dealing with technology that have changed the way that people uh, look at the world. I'm particularly interested in Christianity, um, atheism, and, and Islam. And um, if you think about how those uh, the interaction between those religions has developed over time as well, that's also had a lot to do with technology, um, whether it's the printing press only or um, uh, the development of people being able to uh, to travel uh, around um, this technology is in the middle of this from the very beginning. So um, we uh, we aren't dealing with something necessarily new here. Okay, let's start talking about social media. Um, I'm using Facebook to uh, spread out this uh, the, the talk that I'm giving right now um, and. Uh, uh, it, it works as a tool for disseminating information in some ways, but it's also a, a network for me to connect with uh, different people. Um, there's two sort of so, sort of concepts that I want to want us to think about in, in thinking about social media. I'm using Facebook as an example of social media here, um, but you could apply the same sorts of things to um, uh, to other social um, social networks online. But Facebook is right now sort of the dominant way in which we we interact in in uh, uh, in this way, though. Um, uh, and so I'll use it as, as the example for, for the research that I'm using. So we have uh, Facebook users here, mostly no, no. Noel, not no. a Facebook user. Um, you understand how Facebook works <laughs> a little bit, yeah. Um, uh, Facebook is all about making networks of uh, connections with different, uh, uh, different, uh, different people who you are your your friends, right? Your friends on Facebook. You have followers on on Twitter. You've got friends on Facebook. Um, Facebook creates a kind of difficult context in which you are. I put Facebook at the at the middle of these concentric circles where you've got uh, friends, family, and and colleagues, and you find yourself in a place where you are interacting with. Um, a lot of different people um, from a lot of different social contexts um, at the same time, and um, there's two useful ways of thinking about um, about context and social media uh, spaces, um, and that I want to highlight here. The first is one's imagined audience, so that when you are presenting yourself or you're talking online, who do you imagine is the person that's viewing the content that you're you're putting out there. Now, on Facebook, you have sort of a, an idea in general of, of who it is that's looking at your content because you have your friends list, but that could be a pretty big list of, of people. And um, you might start to think to yourself, well, if I tweet, I've been uh, or tweet or, or, or put a Facebook post about, um, if I've been doing house renovations, any of my people who've talked to me have heard about house renovations, and Juliet's doing house renovations as well. So if I put a, a post on Facebook about house renovations, I know that probably Juliet's going to like it, right? Um, and I know that if she posts something about house renovations, I'm probably going to like it as well. We so support each we're supportive. Other. We're supportive. We're supporting each other. It's a difficult context that we're in, um, trying to do house renovations. Um, anyway, that content is available for any any one of my Facebook friends. Um, 
but in my mind, I know that there's a group of people who are more interested interested in that in, than, than other things. And this relates not just to Facebook, but things on Twitter as well. So I'll tweet about particular things. I tweet about kind of um, academic things. Um, and um, I know that there's a group of people who will be interested in that compared to if I tweet about something political, right? Um, it's not that other people can't see what it is that I'm presenting. It's that I am in some way um, uh, producing content for specific people at, at specific times, right? Um, so in my mind, I have an idea of who it is that I'm speaking to, okay? That's the, the idea of, of the imagined audience. Now, it could be anybody. My home renovations, everybody's seeing that, potentially, right? But in my mind, I'm, I'm targeting particular uh, groups of people. Um, this idea that it's public, though, that, that I've got this groups of friends, family, and colleagues on Facebook, and I have to in some way be authentic in front of all of them, is uh, been talked about in terms of context collapse. Um, and context collapse is just the idea that suddenly I've got to be uh, authentic. I have to have an authentic self in front of this, this mix of three different groups of people, um, even while... Um, I'm not necessarily the same person to those three different groups of people, right? So if you know me as a, a family member, um, that's a different, um, it's a different relationship than if you know me as a uh, as a colleague, right? Um, and we know this is from our social lives, right? You you you're all a particular person here. You have a particular identity that you're performing in this context, but you'll go home and you'll have a different identity that or or performance that you'll have in front of your family for example or in um uh in, in a club that you're a part of right we, we're performing different identities at different times facebook and social media makes it difficult because suddenly we have to think about all these groups of people at the same time and i got to be careful i mean for me it's always about swearing right can i swear in this context i probably won't right I talk about this with students too i swear in front of class or not like I got to be careful, right? I got to think about how people view me. I got to think about uh, the different kinds of uh, uh, eyes that are on me. Whereas if I'm with my friends or I'm out drinking with my friends, I don't, I don't care, right? I'm not, not so I don't care. Um, I can present a different version of myself, right? Um, this is problematic in social media contexts, um, and I'm going to talk about how this relates to religion as we go forward. That's the thing that I'm um, particularly interested in. We're following so far. Everybody's uh, doing okay. So when you take Imagine uh, Audience and you put it together with context collapse, you can come up with this idea of context design, which is the fact that we've developed tools in which we can start to think about how we present ourselves at particular times and um, uh, in particular ways to different audiences, even though everybody can look at it at the same time. And we were just talking today in, in our, our media class about how um, when you post something on YouTube, for example, you post a video on YouTube, in theory, anybody can see that video. But who sees that video is um, not just anybody. They have to find it in a particular way, and they have to be guided to it um, by, by either by an algorithm that helps them find it through a search, uh, a search term, or by somebody targeting a particular audience at a particular time. Um, so we can... Um, we can think about how we, we use our um, the, the, the posts that we're doing and focus it in a way that uh, presents ourselves um, the, in relationship to the, the, um, the, the audiences that we want to. The, the example of me posting the house renovations and in some way keeping in mind Juliet as a potential audience, um, that's a good example of, of context design where I'm I'm thinking about whether explicitly or implicitly about who it is that I'm targeting and how I'm presenting myself in that um, in that particular place. So it isn't just a free for all. It's not just a um, I've started off um, and I and I have no idea who's watching and and I have to be really super careful about um, what I say. It's actually a little bit more um, uh, more nuanced than that. So how do we take this into the into the arena of of, of religion? Um, and how uh, religious interaction happens in online spaces. Um, there's a whole area about digital religion, a whole area of, of research that's, uh, that's being done, really good work um, uh, about how religious experience um, happens in online contexts, how people um, 
uh, have very meaningful religious experiences um, and religious let's say religious relationships relationships in religious communities and in, in online spaces um, for um, for me I guess I'm less interested in in things like online churches and, and how people are building community in, in online spaces um, and more interested in how people are presenting their faith um, to um, to each other um, but that doesn't mean that uh, that we we're developing in in as as we go forward in in as technology develops and we have our, our smartphones and we're interacting with each other that we're in a place now where um, that dichotomy or the dichotomy is maybe the wrong word the split between the offline world and the online world is as clear as it used to be so um, there's a, a good book that's come out um, last year by Tim Hutchings um, who's at um, Durham. And he talks about, uh, it's a kind of the history of, it's called Creating Church Online. It's a really good book um, about the history of, of doing online church. And he's going from this space of like, when you used to go online and you were typing at a computer, you know, in front of a, a monitor and you're sitting down in front, of, uh, in front of a computer and you're going online. But we really have increasingly moved away from that, right? I mean, everybody now, how many people have phones out in front of them? A lot of you, how many, I mean, a lot of you, us will check our phones during the, during the talk. I don't have my phone on me and I feel a bit like whatever that, whatever that feeling is, even though I'm giving a talk, I feel like I, if I get a text or something, I'm going to miss it, you know, it's just going to be some disaster. It's, it is, is it sad? You asked me to get my yeah, thank you, yes. <laughs> um, but I mean, students in, in, in classes will have phones out, and this doesn't, for me, it's not about this being like, um, it's just the world that we live in. We live in a world in which we, that online and offline world is not as, um, is not as, uh, as, as, uh, as clearly separated. And it's just going to get, if, if you're unhappy with it now, wait until we have like our, you know, our virtual reality glasses or whatever you know it's going to be happening all the time um, that we're, we're, we're connected in some way and we won't think of it as being strange I don't think that's the other interesting thing about it I don't think it's strange that you have your phone out in front of you and, and technology becomes normal as we go forward um, I digress what I'm saying what I'm trying to say is that we we're getting to a point now where we talk we can't talk about religion online and religion offline um, it's that's a dated way of talking about it now because the churches now exist in places where um, they have online presence and they have offline presences as well. Newman University has an online space and an offline space. We don't have a, well, we have learning environments online. We're, we're very much in that same that same kind of place. Um, so we are using um, uh, we're using technology in some way to bridge between these two different uh, uh, these two different spaces. They aren't clear. Uh, any, anymore as, as being separate spaces. I do want to say a couple of things though about what, um, if we're starting to think about online um, resources or online um, uh, mediated communication, a couple of things that I think are important for the, the conversation that I want to talk about. The first one is the internet um, as a kind of resource, um, using the internet to get uh, resources about religion in particular, I think is still a really important kind of um, uh, important kind of use of, of online facil facilities or online um, uh, technologies. Well, m my students today were do doing this uh, article about, um, is partially about John 15, right? And to understand what John 15 is about, they went online and found a video about John 15 and, and showed us this video, right? I mean, it's a perfect use of using YouTube as a kind of resource of explaining what a, a Bible verse is about, for example. Um, that's important that people are, are doing that. And the resource that they found was an, an American guy talking about John 15 um, as though he's giving the opinion about it or the, 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 the authoritative idea about it. Um, he's not necessarily an authority. We, you didn't decide who, we didn't really have any information about who he was or kind of what, what his, his skill was. But he was more or less right about what he said, right, from what you could tell. Yeah. Um, sorry, I, I, I realized after giving a, you're giving a research talk right after teaching. Like my mind is full of all these things that we were talking about while we were we were teaching. It's it's great that the kind of the connections between them. 
The problem with that is, with this guy, well, he's an American, right? And he's probably got, as I'm listening to him with my evangelical ears on, I, I have, I can hear kind of the evangelical register, and I'm thinking, well, he has a set of beliefs that I can hear by, by, by how he's talking. Like, I know in some way that he's not Catholic, right? How do I know that? Well, it's because I, there's a register of how he's talking about John, John 15 in a particular way. Um, his physical context, his identity, his denomination of belief, all that is sort of obliterated in this YouTube video where he's just talking about, um, he's just talking about uh, John 15 as though that's the, you know, the way that it is. Um, I give an example of this as well. Um, this isn't just a Christian thing. This is world Dawa mission, Dawa being the term for... Um, I've heard it now described a couple of different ways. I heard I heard somebody saying something uh, describing Dawa as being um, about indoctrination. I thought that was a very unfair description of Dawa. Dawa is, uh, for for me, my understanding of it is just the teaching of of of, of Islam. Um, and it's it, it's been used in a way that's kind of like evangelism. But for for me, the basic meaning of Dawa is just a teaching teaching about Islam. Um, but this website. Um, I went actually looking for this. It's been taken down since I made this slide. Um, I'm not exactly sure why it is, but um, uh, this is this is when I did, did the screenshot of it. This World Dawa Mission site, and if you look at this site, sorry, it's it's a bit we're a bit far away. It's hard to see, but it's presenting Dawa as a as a mission. I think that word mission is 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 an interesting starting point um, because it shows a connection to sort of the evangelical Christian way of talking about the world. Um, uh, which I think is interesting. Um, it's World Dawa Mission, but it's not saying much about, if you go to this website and, and, and had a look at it when it was up, this idea of where it's located, you know, what, um, what the, the identity and the belief of the people who are running it actually is, is not, it's, it's not especially clear. Um, it's presented in this way as being a kind of authoritative uh, representation of Dawa, and what Islam believes, but well, we, there's there's kind of no um, there's no nuance given. It's presented as being a kind of global belief about um, uh, about what Islam is, and this is a, I think an interesting um, uh, an interesting affordance or an interesting um, result of being able to access anything anywhere, or the internet being everywhere and available to everyone, is that suddenly. Islam or Christianity or whatever belief can't just be the belief that's happening in this space for this group of people. Suddenly, what I believe has to apply to like everyone. It has to be a global, um, uh, uh, transnational, international thing. It has to apply to everyone. That truth now has to be something that is not contextual. It, it, it's, uh, it, it goes across to, to, to everyone everywhere. Um, and that, I think, has consequences for how people talk about what they believe and how they, um, how they interact with people who believe different things than them, not just within, uh, uh, in terms of people who believe maybe a Christian and a Muslim, but two Christians together. Um, you, you could have a, such a, a difference if this guy from the states that we were looking at today was to talk to a Catholic from, um, I don't know, from... Brazil, for example, they're probably their idea about what their faith is 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 quite different, although they would give themselves the same the same label. So I think this is this this lack of physical space or physical context has consequences for how people present and talk about what they believe. And that's more or less what I was saying here. Uh, that last point I think is important, though, about the illusion of accessibility. So even though in theory, you can access anything at any time, and you can speak to anybody anywhere, or somebody's on Twitter and you can tweet them. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean you have access to them. It doesn't necessarily mean that you can interact with them. Um, they might, it might appear that you can, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you, you actually can genuinely have an interaction with anybody who's, uh, who's, who's online. You might have somebody, for example, who has two million followers on Twitter, try to get their attention. Um, you don't actually have access to them. You might, you might be able to get access to them, but it's uh, it's it's uh, um, it's not necessarily the case that you'd be able to get uh, uh, get access to anybody that 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 uh, is is in an online space. But I think I more or less had to hit those other points about the caveats about religious belief not being there, and uh, the idea that it's uh, it's universally applicable without qualification. I think is. Um, 
again, I don't want to talk about it being in terms of good or bad, but I do think that this is a consequence of, of, of online interaction. Okay, so some data now. Um, I, the kind of research that I've done has been sort of case study oriented, and um, the reason that I do that is because I, I think it's hard to talk in universals about um, how people interact online or what people believe, any, any of those um, sort of uh, uh, things that I would be interested in doing investigations of. Um, uh, what I'm interested in is what particular people do at particular times and what those, those things can tell us about um, uh, interaction more more broadly or what it can tell us about religious belief more broadly um, there has to be caveats I'm just sort of criticizing universality and applying universal uh, uh, what what you've seen one case across to the whole world so I, it, it then applies to me as well as I look at particular interaction between particular people um, uh, I we need to be careful to say okay this doesn't apply to everyone all the time but I think there are important things uh, important things to learn from good exemplar case studies so what I was interested in in this project, the book that I've uh, I've just finished, um, was this interaction between uh, three rather public users of, um, um, particularly in, on YouTube and Facebook, is where I, I was I was looking. Um, uh, this interaction centered around um, a, a series of videos, a series of videos or two videos, I should say. One made, um, uh, both made by this guy called Joshua Feuerstein. Um, now Josh Feuerstein is like a I don't know how to describe him. I, I've had trouble in the past. Every time I introduce him, I'm like, Josh Feuerstein is a, and then I kind of advertising on his Facebook page because he advertises particular things at particular times. Um, but um, uh, he has quite a few followers. I think at the, at the time that I had finished the book, he had about 2 million people following him on Facebook. And he's kind of like a, a kind of firebrand preacher from Texas who does these like two minute real quick videos on Facebook that are like, you know, really intense. Um, uh, usually, they involve some sort of scripture lesson about something, but they're very, um, uh, they're very kind of uh, in your face and, and meant to have an impact on people. Um, I'll show a bit of one of his videos in a second here. Um, so anyway, he made this video called "Dear Mr. Atheist," um, and this "Dear Mr. Atheist" video it was sort of like um, he was addressing. A generic idea of what he had of a, was of, of what an atheist was, but it wasn't. It's was pretty clear as he was talking about like a, a Mr. Atheist, his idea of what an atheist was. It wasn't really accurate, so it wasn't um, uh, the kind of the beliefs that an atheist has. Um, uh, he was addressing, but they, it wasn't like a genuine person, from what I could tell. He wasn't talking to a particular person. He also made a video called Dear Mr. Muslim, where, um, surprise, surprise, he did a similar kind of thing, making a kind of set of assumptions about what Muslims believe and. Um, uh, again, people who have sort of historical, I was talking about history in terms of technology changing things, in terms of arguments between Christians and, and atheists or Christians and Muslims, pretty much the same kind of arguments that you could ex expect. The, the argument that a, a Muslim and a Christian are going to have is probably about the deity of Christ, right? I mean, that's that's one of the things that's going to come up. Um, and this is what comes up in this video that he makes to, um, uh, to Dear Mr. Muslim. Anyway, to his surprise, maybe not to his surprise, um, on YouTube, not on, on Facebook, uh, the amazing atheist um, whose affiliation is um, apparent. I hope um, amazingness, of course. Uh, that was it was a joke. He's he's affiliated with him. <laughs> John Fontaine, who is a Muslim revert uh, from Manchester, actually. He's, uh, um, uh, he's in Birmingham next week, um, uh, and I'm, I'm part I'll show a little bit of a video in a second here, but they addressed the video as though like he was making a legitimate argument and they were, you know, they were responding to it, um, and sort of going point by point and answering what, what he had said about uh, the different, uh, uh, his ideas about Muslims and, and atheists. Um, anyway, uh, I got... Uh, in in the interaction that I was looking at, I was essentially looking at the times that they were speaking to each other where Fierstein made the video and there were the responses. I was doing analysis of that, but I was also looking at kind of how they were using social media more generally. And I looked at the videos that they had posted sort of before that time and after that time. I was looking basically, I was trying to get about 20 videos a person. I ended up with more because Fierstein's videos were, were shorter, but I was trying to get a, a good sample of what happened before this interaction, what happened afterwards, if I could track any kind of changes, um, uh, those sorts of things uh, was what I was interested even though I said I wasn't interested in generalizability, I sort of was about is there a difference between how Christians and Muslims use uh, online uh, uh, online uh, platforms as well. Um, 
So I'm going to show you a little bit of a video here between, and hopefully I'll show you just a, um, a, a clip from it uh, where uh, this is Fierstein and this is, uh, this is Fontaine. Uh, this is a bit of the video where, um, uh, uh, or a bit of Fontaine's video where he made that response to Josh Fierstein. He took clips from Fierstein's video and he played them in his, in his video and then responded to them sort of point by point. And I'm going to pick up, hopefully if this works, it's going to pick up about halfway through the video where um, Fontaine is responding to a specific point from, uh, from Fierstein. Or not. Well, this is a complete failure. One second here. Oh, you got to turn it on. Let's see if this this has solved my problem. It does not. Okay. Um, this has actually happened to me in the past, and what I've done instead is played the video. You can see the video, and I can talk over it and tell you what's happening. Anyway. This is Fontaine's making this response on, on, on YouTube, which you can see, uh, one of the things that you can see from it is that it's quite, um, it, it's quite well produced. And he's got this uh, kind of bumper that he's, he's, he's put in it as well, a kind of uh, information about uh, 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 his online presence and stuff. And he's responding to, to Fierstein here. Like I said, he's playing a bit of Fierstein's video and then responding to it. Um, this is an interesting point there where he's, he's put the hat on backwards. What he's done is, if you look at uh, Fierstein, Fierstein's got his hat on backwards. That's sort of how he talks to the camera. He's, again, he's sort of presenting this kind of, um, I don't know if it's cool. I, I, I struggle to say cool. He's presenting himself as being a kind of, um, a what? Chilled out. Chilled out, I like that. Um, yeah, a backwards hat kind of person. Um, I used to be a backwards hat kind of person. Now I'm a bow tie kind of person. I don't know what that says about me. What? I, uptight. I've gone from chilled out to uptight. Wow. Well, um, anyway, so this part of the video, he's been playing it, and he's been talking back and forth about what, what Fierstein is saying. One of the points that Fierstein makes about all this is that um, uh, you can't say that Jesus wasn't, God, because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. And this is his, like, this is his trump card to, um, to, uh, to Fontaine. Um, and Fontaine is saying to him, he needs to read the Quran. See what the Quran actually says about Jesus. So this is the, I'm the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father except through me, right? And Fontaine says, we have no problem with that. So Islam has no issue with this at all. You don't know what you're talking about. I mean, he doesn't say you know what you're talking about. But he says, you know, he says he's the way. We believe he's the way. He says he's the life. We believe he's the life. I don't see what the problem is. Um, that actually works pretty well, I have to say, without having the sound. Um, and there's the transcript from it. He says, as a Muslim, we have no problem. It doesn't contradict Islam to say these things about Jesus. That really what you're doing is that you're interpreting the scripture and that interpretation of the scripture is what's informing your reading of that, which is actually interesting to me because Fierstein doesn't, he doesn't sort of acknowledge that there's an interpretation, interpretive element of it. Again, so it goes back to the universality of the point, which is that, like, um, it, uh, it, it applies to everyone, right? He's not interpreting, he's just saying what the Bible says, um, which uh, uh, Fontaine is, is coming against, right? Now, what I'm interested in is not so much the argument there about Jesus and, the, and, and, and whether or not Jesus is God or not. It's about why they're doing this in the first place, which is a, a, a difficult question, I think. We were just having, again, in our class, we're talking about why do people post videos on YouTube? It's an interesting question. My, my daughters right now, they really want to have, my eldest one wants to have a YouTube channel. She's, a, she's going to tend Oh, and I keep saying to her, you know, when you, you turn 13, you can do it. She's making YouTube videos now for herself. I was in bed the other day, and I was listening through the wall. I could hear her saying, hi, YouTube. It's Naomi. Uh, I'm, this is my unboxing video. And she was doing an unboxing video for herself. And she's practicing with her friend. Um, because this is sort of like the, the, the thing that, that she's interested and interested in doing. And it's about performance it's about understanding um I, and it's like kids putting on plays for themselves they're doing the kind of um uh, uh a kind of a kind of performance a way that we're, we're we're used to interacting or we're used to seeing information presented to ourselves um 
my daughter wants to have a YouTube video, I think in some, or YouTube channel in some sense, because she wants to be seen. She wants to have visibility and wants, because she sees people who are visible on YouTube and thinks to herself, this is, this is something that's good or valuable. I think the same sort of thing is happening here. I mean, they aren't doing unboxing videos of, of squishies from China, um, but they're doing like, um, uh, they're, they're, they're doing a kind of um, work that's about increasing their visibility. So the reason that, I think, my, my analysis is that the reason that Fontaine responds to Feirstein isn't because he's trying to make some case, trying to convince Josh Feirstein to become a Muslim. I mean, maybe, maybe that's what he's trying to do. Um, but uh, I think more likely what he's trying to do is use this as an attempt to present what he believes about Islam and what he believes about um, uh, 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 Jesus. As, as, and, and it's not about having a particular argument or having a dialogue with Feuerstein in a particular way. It's about presenting what he already believes. Um, and that's great, I think, on some level. I mean, there's, there's, there's no problem with this kind of like wanting to present what you believe. But I think that the, 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 when it comes up in this kind of context of debate and drama, it's a, again, I don't want to talk about it being dangerous, good or bad, one way or the other. I think it orients the conversation in a particular way that Fontaine now, as he responds to Feirstein, what he's doing then is uh, orienting himself towards the arguments that Feirstein is making. And that has the consequence of them talking an awful lot about Jesus as opposed to anything else that you might be talking about from a, from a Muslim perspective. Um, it dictates the conversation in a particular way that it ends up being about one set of issues as opposed to another set of issues. And I think that has, as, as I watch the argument happen, I think this has, um, this has issues or it has, um, it has potential effects for how belief then develops going forward. Because you say, well, if we're in a debate drama context in which we have to respond to Christianity, we have to talk about Jesus, um, that creates a, a faith that in some way is oriented towards responding to those kinds of things. And people watch these videos and say, well, it's a, the, in some way, Dawah is about responding to Christian arguments about, uh, about uh, the divinity of, of Jesus. And there's so many videos about this. Um, I could have done a whole book on those arguments alone. It just comes up again and again and again. Um, I think that's, we should, we should ignore that in terms of how that influences how, um, how a faith could develop going forward. I didn't spend much time talking about um, my methods or methods here. I'm going to spend the last sort of five and ten minutes here talking a bit about a particular analysis, uh, uh, kind of analysis, and then um, take some questions. So is, is 50 minutes is okay? Yeah. Uh, related to it necessarily. In this context, there's a, a positioning that's happening where I'm presented as, as researcher something, uptight bow tie wearer, <laughs> as opposed to backward hat, relaxed, chilled out guy. Um, but there's a kind of social context that's happening here, and it, it, it's working because you are listening to me present my research, and I'm presenting my research, and we've, um, uh, the positioning is essentially not, there, there's no conflict between these, these two things. Um, but this is not who I am all the time. You'll be shocked. To, I go home, I have other positions, other, other social roles. Uh, well, the word role here is, 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 is problematic here. Social positions that I take, right? I, I, I can also be husband, I can be father, I can be, um, I'm, it's quite limited now. <laughs> I can be many things. And I was like, ah, those, those are the three main things, right? Teacher, husband, father, right? Different kinds of identities. Um, this guy, Michael Bamberg, though, talks about positioning, particularly as it relates to storytelling. And this is what I'm interested in um, as it, it, it comes up in, um, in a couple of these YouTube videos where people tell stories. There's a lot of storytelling that happens. And um, what Bamberg does is take storytelling and says, okay, let's think about it on three levels here. On one level, you've got the characters within a story, whatever story it is that you're telling. Um, the example I always give is Little Red Riding Hood, right? We all know Little Red Riding Hood. There's characters in Little Red Riding Hood. They do particular things. Um, they interact with each other in particular ways. There's the characters within that that fairy fairy tale world, right? That's position one. That's or that's level one of the story, right? If we go up to level two, we've got the story that's being told, but we have somebody who's telling the story, and we have people who are listening to the story, right? So if I tell you Little Red Riding Hood here. Um, I don't know why I would, right? Um, it doesn't really make sense why I would tell Little Red Riding Hood here, but um, so I'm talking about my kids. Uh, imagine me telling my Little Red Riding Hood to my daughters, right? 
um, in relationship to making YouTube videos. It would, that would be a good, uh, a good character lesson for them. Um, if I was telling them the story of Little Red Riding Hood, I'm not just telling them that story for any reason, right? Um, or for, for no reason at all. I'm positioning myself in a particular way and I'm positioning them in a particular way, right? Um, I'm positioning myself as, as a kind of uh, uh, authority and positioning them in, in a way that they um, have to learn to listen to authority, right? There's a reason for telling that story is the point. And that reason for telling the, the story tells you something about how I'm seeing myself and how I see them. That's level two of the, posi of the positioning, right? Stories are told for reasons and they're meant to uh, put the storyteller in a particular place and, and the audience in a particular place. And then you can go one level above that and say, okay, what, what is the story, the story, t the story, the storytelling, you know, the audience and the storyteller, what does that tell you about how the storyteller views the words, world sort of more generally? What, what can we say about, um, uh, what can we say about my, uh, my view of the world if I tell the story of Little Red Riding Hood to my kids? It has something to do with authority. It has something to do with um, uh, uh, my view of following rules, potentially. There's a lot of different things you could unpack as you go in, in these three different levels. And they're related to each other, right? You get from one to two, to, from two to three. And you can take three then to go back to two, to go back to one. You can move between these three different levels, yeah? Um, these, stories, uh, uh, these stories can then often be repeated in particular kinds of... Um, uh, uh, particular kinds of uh, uh, discourses, if you want to use the word discourses, storylines, if you want to use the word storylines, Bamberg uses the word master narratives. They're stories that we generally tell again and again and again. Little Red Riding Hood is an interesting story, but we can think of stories that are like Little Red Riding Hood. They, they tell us similar kinds of stories again and again. And again. Um, one of the most interesting uh, research about this kind of storylines and, and how um, people tend to play the same generic roles in different, in different, uh, in different stories about uh, 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 the other in this particular case is about um, this research looking at how Osama bin Laden talked about George W. Bush and how George W. Bush talked about Osama bin Laden. Essentially the same story, but with the, the characters swapped around here, right? So there's a kind of generic story about good versus evil, good triumphing over evil, violence being a part of that. Well, um, it shouldn't be a surprise to us that, that the, the two sides are telling essentially the same story to each other, right? So um, when I'm looking at, at, at my text, I'm wondering what's happening on all these three different levels, right? These are the kinds of questions that I come to the text with. I'm not just interested in uh, what's, what's on the face of the story. I'm trying to figure out what that relationship is, is saying uh, about uh, what a person is, how they're positioning themselves in relationship to their audience, and what that tells us about the, kind of their worldview more generally. Um, go back to Fierstein in an example that he, he tells here. Again, short two-minute video that he makes. You have an, a sense of how he makes a video now because I showed it a bit earlier. He's like, he's got the camera and he's right, he's, his face is sort of in it. Like, so he's sort of face-to-face -face talking about it. And um, he says, hey, Josh Fierstein here. Have you ever been going to a situation, particularly a storm in life, where it seems like the wind and the waves constantly pound and pelt against you? Well, check this out. Not every storm is a curse. Uh, some can actually be a blessing. In fact, check this. When it was that Noah built the ark, while well, he was in a valley, he built the ark in a valley, in a low place, in a desert land. But when he goes through the storm, well, the storm takes him up and rests him on the mountaintop. Uh, there's a time in your life that God can allow you to go through a storm, but it's not to persecute you, it's not to punish you, it's to elevate you, it's to take you to another level. I want you to know and be encouraged today that God has a strategy in the storm. God bless you guys. Okay? So there you go. You've got a story, you've got Noah and the ark. You've got a relationship between the storyteller and the story here, and you've got something that tells you a little bit about how he views the world. And how he views the world here is actually interesting. Going back to that global evangelism thing, it's a bit of a, I say this as an American, and my other American uh, uh, colleague can, can either say that I've, I've got it right or wrong here, but this idea that God has a strategy in the storm sounds very American view of God here, that, that there's this kind of... God, God, the strategy man, you know, he's got, he's got a plan for you. He's working it out for you in a particular way. That word, that word strategy, I think is really, is really key here. He's not though presenting this. He's not like, hi, I'm Josh Fierstein here, the American evangelist who's going to tell you American theology. That doesn't come up at all. He's talking in a way that, that sees the you here as being a generic you, being everybody. You being you as well. This applies to you too, not just to, to the people who are watching him on, on Facebook. So it's, it's an interesting story to me because it, uh, it ties back into the Bible. There's some interesting theology there. It gives it a kind of authority. Again, go to, well, I mean, this is his thing as well, this, um, uh, using um, uh, uh, the 
the discourse of the Bible to get authority. Um, you'd be familiar with that. But it does tell you a little bit about his Western American understanding of it. And it also makes him an authority, which I think is really, really interesting as well. The way that he talks, the way that he positions himself, we don't know anything about him um, other than the fact that he is talking about the, the Bible in, a, um, in an authoritative way and using words. And you could find some kind of construction that has some sort of similarity with that, not that exact same thing, but you could find some sort of relationship to that, that there's a, there's a kind of um, echoing of biblical language here. Um, as I finish, this is basically what I'm, what I'm thinking about religious communities and why people are positioning themselves in the way they are, why they are talking in the way they are, and why they're doing what they're doing. Um, I think that social media puts people in a place where we have this context collapse that involves people who agree with them, people who disagree with them, and then people who are somehow um, unaffiliated or uninterested. I had this, um, I showed this slide at a chaplain's conference last week, and we got arguing about the interested, uncommitted, whether how what the label should be for that. But um, uh, I think that when people are presenting themselves, what, what, what the, the effect of social media in this context is, is that people have to think about not just talking to people that they believe with, that, that they agree with, but people that they don't agree with, who, who could be actively attacking them, coming after them, and then also positioning themselves in a way that relates to people who might be uninterested or interested in and unaffiliated. So that at the same time, they're, they're doing this very difficult positioning of themselves and the viewer um, that has to take into account all these different contexts um, or all these different audiences and how they are viewing what it is that they're saying. And that affects then how the discourse develops over time. Um, that shift in that presentation of belief, um, I, I, I think um, as that, that audience shifts, that the presentation shifts as well. And so they have to, th as you're thinking about talking to those three different audiences, you've got to be careful about what it is that you're saying and that takes into account these different audiences. And I think that that has what it is you talk about and what you spend your time focusing on. And I, I think that as this develops, as people spend their time focusing on particular things, that has consequences then for how belief develops over time. It has to. If you spend your, all your time talking about a particular topic, a particular tech, you're contractually obligated to hawk my book wherever I, wherever I go. Um, the book is for sale. It's available on Cambridge Core, though, so um, you can uh, see it on the, uh, on the Newman website um, or the Newman Library uh, website. Um, I've also been working on this, uh, this edited collection about uh, English language studies that, that comes into some of these issues about uh, globalism and um, spread of language and the effect that has on, on social interaction as well. So it's not just about religion, but um, sort of everything more general. Thank you. I've gone a little bit over. I'm Perfect sorry. Yeah. Cheers. <laughs> And we've landed, we've landed with one person left on Facebook, so. <laughs> Stephen, thank you so much for that absolutely fascinating talk. Yes. I think it kind of encompassed all the particular subject specialisms that are in the room um, very much. So I'm going to open up to questions without any more ado. Julia. Um, I thought it was really interesting. You've got three white men on there, which in a way is quite useful for comparison. Um, it was interesting. Is it Feuerstein? Feuerstein, yeah. Feuerstein is a Christian with a Jewish sounding name. Yeah. Fontaine is a Muslim living in Britain. He does not look like a British person would expect a Muslim to look. Yeah, no, he gets called a ginger quite often. Yeah. yeah. To what extent do you think the way they're presenting themselves is to do with the constant need to defend their religious identity because people might be surprised yeah. when they find out what their religious affiliation is? Yeah. Well, let me first address the, the white men issue, which I talk about as well. Um, there are a lot of white men doing this, um, and there's something to be said about that. Um, and um, I, I don't know, uh, as I was thinking about who I was going to study, I'm doing a kind of an ethnographic study of these people over time, and this is the one that comes up and becomes interesting and a good exemplar. Um, and I wonder whether or not, as I go forward in the research that I'm doing, I need to be more active to look for um, other voices about it. Um, so recognize that. Um, the all-male panel thing is not a, not a good look for well, anyone. Well, it's a useful basis for comparison. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. Um, your question about how people defending themselves, yeah, I think so. Fontaine definitely. Um, his, the most viewed video that he is in there is a... a um, he, traitor is one of the key words that happens, you know, like... Um, so yeah, yeah. 
that I do think that's a part of it. Fierstein's Jewishness, I mean, he's from Texas, and I, I think that there's a kind of like, uh, there's a kind of a bit of, I, again, I, I don't want to overstate the kind of American idea about like, you can kind of be whoever you want to be, and if you want to be a Texan who has, um, you know, the, is, well, I guess it maybe this says more about me than it does about you. His name doesn't sound, the first thing I think about is not that it's Jewish. Um, but again, maybe that says something more about me than it says about uh, says about him. But nobody brings that up. I will say that, and that that's, that's not a not a trope at all. Not not in the way that that the Fontaine one is. As the amazing atheist, I don't. Uh, he sort of fits the bill. I don't think he's he's spending any time. He he ends up being his political positions. I think become more of an issue than than his um, his atheism because is he American or British? he's American as well. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I just wondered. He came from one of the areas where you have to defend atheism. Or well, in the U.S., that's pretty much everywhere, I mean, imagine, but, um, yeah, yeah, particularly, um, he's been around for a while, you know, so, um, uh, but no, I mean, I, I, um, I, I don't think that he, that he's worried about his identity as an atheist, necessarily. Do you find there is much debate? Uh, in my well, experience is, with my, especially my students, yeah. using some of these resources, they just will quote you from back what they already believe. Um, if there's a response to the science that is critical, the other person just runs back with the yeah. same thing said in a different way. Yeah. I, don't, I don't see much serious debate. Yeah. And I think part, part of the issue with not being able to identify where they come from is, is a real problem. So when my Muslim students tend to latch on to Christian sites in their essays and their pieces of work, they normally can't distinguish between sites that are extreme evangelical, broad evangelical, uh, Catholic, or, or whatever. And that's the real problem, because it, there's no context, as you pointed out, there's, in a curious way, there's no context. Yeah. Um, so about debates, I'm, I'm working on my next project, the, the, is, is about sort of that, that issue about looking, <clears throat> doing, I'm going to do some discourse analysis of actual debates between you know, sort of two and a half hour long point counterpoint things. Um, the the too long didn't read of that is no, it's it's not any better. I don't think because in that situation it's a formal debate and and it's about scoring points against the other side. And I I, I don't know. I, I for me for my for my opinion about this and it is related some, somewhat to the research that I've done is that when you take religion out of it. And you have okay, Christian and Muslim. You go do charity work together, or you go um, bowling together. And bowling comes up as a, my idea of a fun time out. Um, that in that situation is where is where connection happens and where shared experience happens. And when people are living together, that's where it happens. I don't think it's going to happen in a kind of in in a debate situation in which you are set up. As verses, that's the, the first interesting part of this about the debate. De, uh, the debate um, language is it's Christianity versus Islam, the Bible versus the Quran. Like it's this kind of like that's death match, area. you know, as opposed to they're very different books, you know. <laughs> like that's it, it, it's funny. I, I just finished done doing this, this trans uh, transcribing this two and a half hour debate, and really the the answer to it is that the Quran and the Bible are two very different books created in very different ways. And if you try to compare them to each other, yeah, absolutely. it's problematic. No, um, well, this is just not maybe it's not so much a question, but just a comment for everyone to maybe respond to. Um, you just described something where Christians and Muslims or any different kinds of people come together yeah. and build relationships and community and understanding and all those things. But those are things that are not online. They're face to face. And well, it's it's, it's probably it, maybe not problematic, but it's worrying that at the beginning of your talk you were saying, but the but the bl the blur between being offline and being online is disappearing. We're always online. Everything is always there. So, how do we move forward? Yeah, I would I I would I would first push back against the fact that there aren't meaningful relationships online. Um, Pauline, who sits over here, um, is mm -hmm. uh, a colleague. Who I've met in person two or three times. We're friends on Facebook. I feel like I I have such not a close relationship with her, but I I know what's going on in her life, 
I know the, the things that are happening. I feel connected to her. And when I see her, I don't have to have this. I feel a, I feel a real connection with her as a friend. Um, that is created by Facebook. Um, this house renovation thing, I joked about it before, but it's actually a meaningful, it's a meaningful thing. I mean, I, I, I don't want to be too like, um, I don't know, uh, overstated, but I feel like my relationships on Facebook are real relationships with people. And they are because I have met people through friends on Facebook who then I meet in the real world and we have conversations and it's like we're, we are old friends. So I think that the, the question for me is about, um, it's not about it being one way or the other. I think it's a matter of, of, of different kinds of things happening in different places. And certainly that, that Creating Church Online book, those people have, would say they had close religious faith-based relationships with but each other. It would be interesting if you could get the counterpoint to that would be the interfaith. Muslims and Christians mm -hmm. are friends online. Yeah. Yeah, I, I imagine though, again, the problem is you'd have to find a context wherein people are friends online and their faith is sort of, it's, it's it, the reason that it doesn't come up in, in some sense because it's not, it's not that important to their relationship with each other, right? I imagine like if you went on MomsNet, for example, and you found a bunch of people talking about some uh, illness, I bet you, I bet you you go to cancer sites or you go to say, I bet you this, this is a kind of, it'd be a kind of empirical work that you could do. The extent to which someone's, if, if you have a, 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 maybe a, a rare um, disorder or something, and you find a group of people who have that same rare disorder, it won't matter at that, in that context what anyone believes. You'll say like, um, or you have a particular kind of cancer. It's like, support. yeah, yeah, you, you have support together. And it doesn't matter if that person's a Muslim. If we, the thing that binds us together is this, you know, 0.001% cancer that we have, you know. Cheers. Thank you very much. <laughs> and thank you to the people on Facebook as well. Yeah.